Open your Bibles, please, to Psalm 24. So as we think about today, I think it's interesting, um, for those of you who know me, I really try not to let anything other than like church historical holidays change what I'm preaching or teaching on. So that's pretty much Easter and Christmas. And then I occasionally let Pentecost and Thanksgiving bleed into what I preach about. But on today, there's an interesting intersection with Psalm 24 and Father's Day, and it's the idea of stewardship and taking advantage of what you have. And so I want a little bit, everyone to think about the beautiful illustration, actually, that we see this morning of multiple generations seen, but how quickly time flies by. I was watching uh, a speaker talk about how we as young parents are tired of the endless laundry, we're tired of the kids dumping baskets over, we're tired of the fingerprints on every little thing. But then I was told there will come a time when we miss all those little things. And so because of that, we need to steward every moment well. And today, the psalm touches on the idea of stewardship as it introduces it. And so I want us to think about, um, as I said previously, we're going to work our way to talking about spiritual formation. So th today I want to talk about stewardship as a means of, or a lens that we look at our spiritual formation and our attachment to things, people, and time but also the end motivation behind some of our life actions. So interestingly enough, on Father's Day, there's that combination of understanding the momentary stewardship as well as trying to find a motivation outside of your feelings and your thoughts in that moment. So listen along with me to Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and established it in the waters. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him. Who seek your face, God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is he? This king of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the king of glory. So first slide, there's this, oh, next slide, I should say. Verses 1 and 2 introduce this concept of stewardship. Now, some of you see it directly, and some of you might need to have it kind of spelled out how verses 1 and 2 introduce this concept of stewardship. Now, interestingly enough, this morning we celebrated rain in this community. We are glad, we're glad for rain, because rain, rain makes things grow. When things grow, we get a better harvest. When we get a better harvest, we have better financial stability. We can do all these items. Now, it's interesting. Oftentimes, as people, and I've seen this, no matter someone's income level or occupation, we get this idea that we own things. And that it is ours. This psalm starts off saying, The earth is the Lord's, and everything in it, the world, and all who live in it. For, or because, the reason why we are able to say this, 
the ownership of God is because he founded it on the seas and established it in the waters. So I'm going to address verse 2 and then I'll work back into verse 1. For the person who is not familiar in the world of thinking of 3,000 years ago, whenever we talked about water and seas in that time, it was kind of like me talking about waters and seas. Now, during the time of praises, there's the praise that we were able to go out to a pond and have kids splash around. Notice, I might have said we or kids, but I really meant other people got in the water and enjoyed it. For me, I don't... So as much as you might see me biking, I prefer my feet placed on ground and gripping them. I don't like ice skating. I don't like rollerblading. Bikes are okay. Swimming is chaos. I like to grip the ground. And the ancient world had this idea, the seas, as in that which surrounds the land, is the area of chaos. If you read your scriptures attentively, you'll see that is where Leviathan lives. That is where the monsters live. The sea is always associated with something that is unruly versus the land is something that is ruly. But in this psalm, and as you'll see continually throughout scripture, the Lord is able to conquer, calm, and overcome this chaos. So verse 2 says, the world, the land, it is founded on the seas, as in not even sheer chaos and disorder can thwart God's moving. And God in his moving and acting decided to create the earth and the people and the inhabitants, which moves back to verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. When you look around, when you see people, when you see people that you are biologically related to, when you see people that you are related to or associated with, whether it be you're in the same community, club, sport, activity, when you look at the house you live in, when you look at the car you drive, the clothes you wear, do you remember this verse? Oftentimes, people believe the lie whenever we walk through this earth that what matters is what you own. A lot of people want to have something that shows their value, their class, their association. So they want to have something that demonstrates it. Sometimes people say, well, I want to have the, my big family, or I want to have my big house. I want to have my car. I want to have the best clothes. If we want to truly walk closely to the Lord and grow close to him and to have a life that reflects the Lord, then we have to first and foremost understand, well, not first and foremost, amongst the first and foremost, we are not owners of anything. We are stewards. What we have is not ours. What we have is a gift that we have a temporary time of taking care of. Now, this is often seen most directly and truly in our families. We don't know how long we will have with our families. I was talking just last night with my best friend from high school, and I was talking about how it was sort of, it was a weird moment watching my dad and the funeral that I was leading talk about his dad. And I hadn't cried at any moment until I started to see how important my grandfather was to my dad. And then I started choking up and I was thankful that I didn't have to go back to speaking for at least a minute. But then in talking to my friend, he asked, in your dad's family, have people been dying out of order or in order? As in, is it usually the oldest who died? And I'm like, I think uh, directly there's one way to look at it. But then I talked about, you know, my dad had some cousins who died young. All this to say, we think we know how long we're going to live. We think we're promised an amount of time with someone, but we're not. How many times do we say, 
well, tomorrow I'll tell someone, or tomorrow I'll teach this, or how often right now do we as parents, especially as younger parents, say, when is my kid going to stop bugging me? We don't like to say that out loud, but parents, how often do we think, I have something I need to do, and my kid is stopping me from doing it? Sometimes it's an important thing, sometimes it's not an important thing. We don't have tomorrow promise. We don't have our ability promise. So we are supposed to steward our family well, but also this flows into every area of our life. Owning something wants to, that concept is trying to put ourselves over. But the repeated theme of scripture is that we are servants. If we look at Genesis 1 and 2 of the creation account, God is the creator and the rule of the earth, and he says, okay, Adam and Eve, now take care of what I give you. This extends to us now. And the sooner we lose things like my and my, and we recognize the stewardship, it'll cause us to have a greater appreciation. Because if we're worried about what we do and do not have, we lose sight of the giver. Oftentimes, I've said this, do not replace the giver with the gift. Fathers, teach this to your kids. Don't think that having more money, more security, working more hours will do anything. And oftentimes, I think that we in this rural community are humbled by the fact sometimes it doesn't matter how many times we go and we plow the ground, pull the weeds, pour water on something, we are not in control. It's the Lord's. And so let's teach our kids. This next, quite, this next few verses are questions that we need to be asking ourselves and thinking through. So can we go to the next slide? Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord, who may stand in his holy place, the one who has clean hands and pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god, they will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, O God of Jacob. There's a lot that can be worked on and flowed through in this chapter, but I want, in these few verses, but I want you to think about what is your motivation for doing things? What is your motivation for wanting to be better, to do better? What is your motivation for wanting to grow? What is your motivation for wanting to be or be declared righteous? In these verses, there's a really interesting interplay where some very fine theological lines have to be navigated because on the one hand, you could say, well, we are able to be closer to God if we're pure and holy. Look, that's what verse 4 says. Look, and then all those people receive blessings, so we just need to try harder to be good. Well, that's inaccurate. So it leads us back to the question, well, if we are unable to be good enough to ascend the Lord's mountain, then why do we even try? If I can't receive this blessing because I can't be good enough, all these questions leave out the reality that we as people need to have the motivation rooted in the relationship with God in the first place. We know as we read in many places through scripture, but especially as we look at the book of Romans or 1 Corinthians, we are able to have clean hands and a pure heart simply because of what Jesus did. And scripture talks about how through Jesus Christ, we are able to be adopted into God's family and we are given the mind of Christ and the Holy Spirit. And that then motivates us as we are aware of being the children of God to be closer to God. But oftentimes I found people kind of 
floundering and asking, well, if I'm made good enough and God forgives everything, what is the, ma- what is the reason why I should live a good life? Now, oftentimes this question is not stated as directly as that. Usually it's indirect or you see someone who's hurt or struggling and they say, why should I keep trying if I'm not receiving any benefits from trying? Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? This Verse is something that we need to repeat and ask. If you work your way through Psalms, it's a repeated question. It's a question posed by someone who had a relationship and who dealt with ups and downs in their life. When you know Jesus, it does not wipe away every doubt concern or fear you might have. Knowing Jesus does not automatically make your life free of discomfort, discord, strife, or hardship. And in fact, I would argue that by knowing Jesus, sometimes we have a more complicated life because we realize there's things we shouldn't be doing and it sometimes puts us in a hard place. Who may ascend the mountain of glory? Who may stand in his holy place? I want want you to ask that question. Because if you are a child of God, if you are redeemed, if you are someone who has placed their faith in Jesus, then you need to, I think, sometimes sit in the awe of the fact that you don't deserve to have the blessing to stand in God's holy place, and that is through Jesus Christ you have this. Again, it's this stewardship. You do not own that spot and of yourself, but it's something that's been given to you. And since you are there, that is whenever you start to ask the question, if I am called to be a child of God, then what does it mean to live as a child of God? And that is where it says, one who has clean hands and a pure heart who does not trust in an idol or swear in a false god. Oftentimes, your clean hands and pure heart are seen by where you act to get provision whenever you're in a tight spot. If you have all the resources, it's easy to say, well, I don't need to steal or cheat to buy this. But where do you go whenever you don't have it all? Now, this is where verses 5 and 6 have this beautiful intersection when we talk about spiritual formation. If you want to have clean hands and pure heart, you cannot do it alone. You notice that it has this singular person in mind in verses 3 and 4, but then it says they and their generation in 5 and 6. This is intentional. I believe Psalm 24 As with many psalms, it got preserved in Scripture because there's this value that the people saw as they were worshiping together, going together. And as you know from history, Jerusalem has had many times where people make their pilgrimage and they'd be reciting psalms as they're going there. Imagine this. You are going to the temple with your family, with your clan, with other people who are wanting to go to celebrate one of the feasts and festivals, and as you're walking on this journey, as you're going up the trail up to Jerusalem, Jerusalem is on a hill, and you're saying, who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? And you're looking around, well, we're doing this. Why are we doing this? How are we doing this? Who may stand in this holy place? They've just recited before that the earth is his. He founded it. And you're saying, the one who has clean hands and a pure heart, you start reflecting as you're going up. Do I deserve to be there? But then you see the blessing that it is to actually pursue God is that you're able to have God himself declare his favor over you and your generation. Now, 
like I said, there's a lot of really fine lines and thorny theological issues to go between there because we aren't just simply promised that follow A, B, C, and D, and you're going to be saved, and your family's going to be saved, and you're going to have a perfect amount in your saving account, and your car's never going to break down, and your dog's going to always be happy, and your your cats aren't going to hawk hairballs on you, whatever. We think that we're going to have this list of things when any time we read, then you'll be blessed. What is the greatest blessing? What is the greatest gift that could ever be known in Scripture? And that's to know God and to be known by Him. Let us not read our 2023 June 18th concepts of blessing into this. Because when we do, I believe we're missing the picture. Move to the next slide because the psalm has these really interesting movements. It starts with talking about the earth being God. Then it talks about as we're ascending this mountain and there's this relational aspect going on. And then the final verses is this repeated chant, these repeated questions, these statements. Now if you're like me, you're going to overthink this and you're going to ask a lot. Listen along and, and try to think, why is this repeated twice? Why are the questions here asked? Lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is he? This king of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the king of glory. It's really foreign to us as people who emphasize so much that God is with you no matter where you go, that every place is sacred, that every place is holy, to think about this declaration going into the temple where the concept of entering in and gates being told, the king of glory is coming through your gate right now, get ready. Who is he? The King of Glory. Who is he? The Lord Almighty. This is just foreign to us as we so impulsively, glibly, blindly want to declare well, God's here. And we kind of diminish God's glory oftentimes. Now, I, I know there's conversations about the sanctuary inside of a church. Now, for those of you who aren't up to date on your Latinized terms, sanctuary just comes from the idea of the holy place. Sanctuary from, coming from the Latin sanctus, which would be in relationship to the Greek holy. And so the idea that this is the holy place in the building. Now, Obviously, all of us know our Bible well enough that we know that God is close to you no matter where you go. He's omnipresent, and the Holy Spirit is with you. So why do we have these more holy places than others? Now, that's a really long, really long conversation that I don't want to fully get into right now. But I want to just point out that sometimes our theology of God and his presence being everywhere gets in the way of our appreciating the overwhelming awe and glory of God's presence. Just because we can say Matthew 28 and saying that Jesus is with us to the ends of the earth doesn't mean that that isn't one of the most amazing, jaw-dropping, stop you in your tracks, inspiring and fear-inducing truths. So let's go back to this thought of this time. Stewardship of your time. What motivates you to be a good steward of your time? Uh, I'm, I'm going through and reading a, a collection of Dilbert comics. Now, there might be some of you who've heard of the Dilbert comics. Now, 
Dilbert is especially um, enjoyed in my home, the Murray home, because my dad was a computer engineer for a while. Um, my older brother, one of my older brothers, he's a mechanical engineer, so the idea of the cubicle life and what, it, what does the life look like in the offices and what are nerdy people about doing. You know, so with that, I'm reading these Dilbert comics and I'm thinking through just the ridiculousness of life. I'm thinking through how funny it is that people can get so lost inside of their world, so lost inside of their thoughts, that they don't realize the simple truth that everything we have, no matter where we are, is a blessing. And so, it doesn't matter if you're in this big office space filled with cubicles of people that are silly or not capable of doing their jobs, or if you're inside of a building, or if you're inside of anywhere, God's presence should cause us to pause. And so if you are wanting to say, what motivates me to do well, ha, I had forgotten why I had the Dilbert reference because I saw something in my corner of my eyes. There's this joke about Rapper. And he was told, you need to be an intern who acts busy. And he sits in his cubicle and he clicks his mouse. He said, how do people act busy before they had a computer? If people inside of a business, in a cubicle, have the only motivation of wanting to appear busy so that way they don't lose our job, how much greater should the reality that everything we have, God is with us. This King of glory, this Lord Almighty, this Lord strong and mighty, who is so significant that the very gates of a city are called to move and open. Do you want to think about why should you be a good steward of your time? This is a bigger motivation than my boss will see me. This is a bigger motivation than what if my friends find out. This is a bigger motivation than... Well, if I don't do the job well, then I don't know. It's everywhere you go, the Lord is there. The Lord, strong and mighty, the King of glory, the one who created the earth and everything in it, the one who created the opportunity that you have right now with what you're doing. Now, the same part of this is that should motivate you to be responsible but this is also where if he's the one who said, take the Sabbath break, I've established the rhythms of having feasts and festivals where you're going to not work, you're going to not trust. If this is the same God who created the year of Jubilee, then maybe we also have the same understanding that no matter our effort as stewards, we can't force God's hand on anything. So this is where as stewards, the understanding of the presence of the Lord Almighty causes us to understand both that fear and motivation to work hard, but also if this is his and he founded it on the seas, then it's really not my work and my effort that gets anything done. So let's go to the final slide because I want to kind of condense this into some takeaways because the spiritual formation aspect of Psalm 24 the biggest thing is we must view possessions. Like I can't even think of a word to talk about things that I'm in stewardship of because everything we have is the thing you ownership, your items, your possessions. These terms, we have to train ourselves to think of ourselves as stewards rather than owners. We have to be intentional about our language. Now the next part is God's creating and redeeming gives him the right of sovereignty. Oftentimes, we want to grasp our ownership because we have too big of a view of ourselves, or we say, I can't give this up to you, God. I can't take a break. No. God is the creator and redeemer. Therefore, it's his right to have a sovereign control 
and to say what is right and what is not right. When we think about the clean hands and the pure heart, we are not the judges of truth. We are not the judges of what it means to be pure or clean. God, as the creator and redeemer, is the one who has the right to declare that. The next part, knowing God is the doorway to growth. Oftentimes you'll see people who want to say, they say, I want to be wiser, I want to be smarter. What we have is a big move in the current culture of people saying, well, I'm spiritual, not religious. We need to realize that it is the knowledge of God, which has to first and foremost start with a relationship with God, that you're able to really grow anywhere in your spiritual relationship with Him. And it doesn't matter how much you think you know, it doesn't matter how much you can do on your own, it is the knowledge of God and the true knowing of God and being known by Him that is the doorway to growth. The final part, just in terms of spiritual formation and growth, we need to repeat truth. We need to read Psalm, Psalm 24, 7 through 10. Has a lot of repetition in it. It's a lot of repeated phrases. I know there was a big joke in the 90s whenever contemporary Christian musical was hitting its highest that, you know, the 7-Eleven song, seven words repeated 11 times, and people made fun of that kind of music, but then read the songs. It's a lot of repetition. It's a lot of one thing stated over and over and over. We need to repeat truth. Even if we know it, even if we believe it, there needs to be a repetition of that truth. Because oftentimes, just as a parent needs to remind a child, we need to remind ourselves of God's truth. We need to celebrate the beauty that we are able to ascend the Lord's mountain, not on our own, but through Jesus Christ himself. And this picture, it's an interesting picture whenever I was thinking about what are the things that I call mine and my possessions. And what clearly demonstrates the ability to not have ownership over the time? One, I don't own the morning time because my kids like to wake up before I'm ready for them to wake up. So I don't have that time other than I need to take advantage of it. The other part, too, is the cat that I had no idea how long it lived, and that cat that I didn't buy but wandered under my house, howling in the dead of winter in Grand Rapids, that cat's no longer alive. I needed to cherish the time that that, really the worst cat you could ever have, that I had with it. But another aspect that is glaringly obvious to me right now as a foster parent is I am not allowed to take pictures of and post in a public forum pictures of the child that I'm raising. Because that child is not mine. I am a steward of the time while that parent is getting the help the parent needs in order to have the child back. It changes how I view every moment and opportunity. I can't say, well, I'll, you know, when this kid is five or six, then I'll be able to enjoy the time when they're running or doing or, right? I mean, right now, Bennett reads and writes. Yesterday, Gracie was writing letters, you know, one for each of the people's name, first letter for the name. I can't wait for that time to appreciate being a parent of a foster kid. I have to take each day as it comes. And so I believe that oftentimes our idea of ownership, it's a beautiful thing, but it's, we have to have it with a grain of salt. I remember distinctly praying when I was with you for Christ, Lord, help me to view these kids as I should. Now I remember the first moment that I was able to have a holy, just outside of my own power, compassion over all the kids that I was in charge of. And I called them my kids. And it's a big issue inside of the coaching world of like, don't call those kids your kids, they're the parents' kids. And you're... We have to understand, when we talk about mine and possession, it needs to be from a pure stance of a stewardship divinely given to us. 
by the holy creator, redeeming God. And every opportunity we have, whether it be with a person, whether it be an item that we own, or the very moment that we have, or the job we're working, that is something that we're a steward of. And the more we understand our stewardship, the more that will draw us to the giver of that item. Let us pray. Lord, thank you. Help us to view ourselves in the proper light in relationship to you. Let us view ourselves as answering to you that we might rightly follow you as humble servants. Thank you for every opportunity that you give us. Pray this in Jesus' name.